So what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about the kind of history of the cypherpunk movement, uh, how mixed nets came to be, um, what different kinds of mixed nets and anonymous remailers there were, and how this is connected to the, the t technology NIM has built and will continue to build into the future. So this is a pretty, uh, pretty uh, long talk, but I'm going to try to do it quickly. You might not get it all, but we'll share the slides. So David Chom came up with this technology. So you probably know David Chom from projects like Elixir, uh, but he invented uh, essentially eCash, anonymous credentials, and mixed nets more or less all within the same two or three papers in between uh, kind of the 1979 and his thesis into the early 80s. And even though it was in his thesis in 79, David Chom, in 1981, kind of invented the notion of a mixed net in a paper called Untraceable Electronic Mail, Return Addresses and Digital Pseudonyms. You can see the word NIM already there, in pseudonym, um, like our wonderful moderator. So what David Chom outlined is he said, well, look, cryptography only solves the problem of how to hide information from an adversary, but doesn't solve who is talking to who. And I even talked to Whitfield Diffie in person uh, at the Financial Crypto Conference, and Whitfield said that, you know, they invented cryptography first because it seemed kind of hard. To, how do you hide the fact that you're communicating with someone? That seemed too difficult. So they invented crypt public key cryptography instead. However... Uh, you know, David Chom's essential concept is very intuitive, which is you take messages, you hand them to uh, some third party or group of third parties, they mix the messages up, shuffle them like a deck of cards, and release them. You already know all this, but it's good to know where it comes from. And, uh, you know, shortly thereafter, in 85, David Chom invents anonymous credentials. So I don't know how much everyone's talking about anonymous credentials. We have a new anonymous credential scheme based on Coconut. Uh, called ZK NIMS, formerly NIM Credentials, coming out. And you can see that David Chom is seeing the future here. He's saying computerization is robbing individuals of the ability to monitor and control the ways information about them is used. And organizations in the private and public sector routinely exchange such information. How do we know if the information is inaccurate, obsolete, or inappropriate? So we have laws about this, the general data protection. But as David Chom warns, Unless we can technically do something about this, the foundation is being laid for what's called a, he calls a dossier society, a society in which computers are used to guess your lifestyles, habits, associations, and then basically will have some sort of chilling effect called causing people to change, alter their observable activities. So anonymous credentials, we'll talk about them more later, but they essentially let you prove something about yourself, like I run a mixed node or... I'm from the United States, or I'm from Scotland, or I'm over 30, or I'm under 18, uh, or I own this private key without revealing anything else. So it's a kind of early, what you could think of as zero-knowledge system. But zero-knowledge systems like ZK Snarks embed entire programs via what's called a circuit. Anonymous credentials essentially embed arrays of values. So if you're a programmer, you're thinking something like JSON. Now, of course, this all seemed great, so David Chom tried to commercialize it using a company called DigiCash. But uh, while there was a lot of interest, the web was just taking off, and it was a little bit too early. And so while they got some initial investment at the last minute in 1998, all of the banks basically backed out of doing digital cash, and David Chom was left and forced to sell his patents. Um, so, you know, DigiCash was kind of like a, closed source uh, startup. That's how people did things in the 80s and 90s, except for free software people like Richard Stallman. And it was a valiant attempt, but ultimately when the web came out, the web was supposed to have DigiCash, or as sometimes called electronic cash or eCash, embedded in it. But because there was no eCash scheme, the web had to wait for PayPal uh, to invent it. At the same point, uh, David Chom's ideas got out there, and they got adopted by a group of people called the Cypherpunks. And they started out as kind of people that would meet in San Francisco and go to each other's houses, a bit like Plato's Symposium, and just drink and talk and discuss the future of humanity. And they had two main concerns. You know, they had a giant concern over mass surveillance, 
and a concern that they would not be able to change or hide their identity from this mass surveillance. And so they called themselves not cyberpunks, but cypherpunks. They opened a mailing list, and we've named our uh, our test nets in them after famous cypherpunks. So, you know, the group was founded by Tim May, who we'll talk about in a second. Um, but you also had involvement people like Hal Finney and Jude Milhoun, who actually coined the term cypherpunks and went to jail uh, for various protest activity, as we see here. So this is all in the kind of early to mid-90s. And people used the term NIM, N-Y-M, actually comes out of an even older book um, by Victor Veen. Sorry, I got that wrong there in the slide. Called True Names, which is you can see this is a kind of early cyberpunk book. This poor guy is directly connected to the, what may be the internet and uh, via these diodes in his head. But if you want to know about the power of someone knowing your actual identity, why it's important to hide it, this is one of the great early fiction books about it. And the term NIM is, in, is kind of invented in this, which is name in Greek. And so pseudonym is false name, anonymous is without a name. So NIM is just name in Greek. But it was used as kind of a technical term in true names. And then F Tim May took this up and he said, look, we need to have a way to defend our identity from surveillance, particularly by governments, but also by large companies. And so he wrote a manifesto, which I recommend everyone read, which was a very influential called True NIMs and Crypto Anarchy. So this is where the term crypto anarchy comes from. But anarchy means, it's again from Greek, uh, you have, it means against kind of like authority. And the question is, how can we create a free society with free life in the midst of this massive technology? It just seems to enable more and more surveillance and control. And Tim May, I know everyone in the blockchain space thinks it's obvious, but at the time it wasn't. He said, we can take this academic work from David Chom and Ron Rivest and Whitfield Diffie and Hellman, we can use cryptography to basically create a technical system which can preserve freedom even as our social system is corrupted. It becomes more and more repressive and more and more based on surveillance and control, what Deleuze calls a society of control. Now, what's some practical examples? Well, the first practical example was an anonymous email remailer system. This was called, uh, this was the first, what's called a NIM server was actually deployed. And it was deployed back in 1993. And it was deployed by this fellow called Helsingius. That's his crazy looking picture there in Finland. And people would, people would use it to, to share information. So you would say, I want to leak something. You would email the leak. This anonymous email remailer, this would, anonymous email remailer would take, uh, would take, sorry, let me go here. Would take out, would substitute your email header and it kept a kind of table of correspondences of who's the email, whose email ta is attached to which NIM, and it would put a fake NIM. So you can see that if you look at this graph here, um, you know, I'm Bob, I'm talking to Alice, I want to share something, maybe a kind of WikiLeaks style secret. But there's no WikiLeaks, so I just email it to Alice, who could be a reporter. Like, you know, you could be Snowden emailing Glenn Greenwald. And rather than email, reporter directly, you email via this anonymous email remailer. And you can see it takes out Bob's name and puts XYZ at anon.pinnet as the NIM or the fake name. And you can see on the server, they keep a, um, a table between the real name and the fake name. That ends up being a terrible idea. It ends up being a terrible idea because the internet, uh, the Church of Scientology had their secrets leaked on the internet in 1994. And the Church of Scientology, I don't know how many, hopefully no one here is a Scientologist, decided they were going to censor, this was such valuable religious data, this was data about the fact that people in Scientology actually believe in space aliens and all sorts of crazy stuff, that they were so embarrassed by this leak that they basically took legal action against uh, the non the the anonymous remailer and they shut it down in 1994 because of all of the legal attacks and worse uh 
it was brought down. The legal tax started in 94, kind of totally killed it by 1996. And even worse, because you can see the anonymous email remailer kept a table, like a little SQL table that connected your identity to your anonymous identity. It could get the real identities of the people that leaked the information. Uh, that's dangerous. And the question is, why would you keep that table? And the reason is that's a simple way to basically determine, like if I send you an anonymous email, unless it's something like, I don't know, a bomb threat or a, a one-way leak, like usually if I'm a reporter, I'm, if I, let's say I'm Edward Snowden, I want to leak the NSA documents, people are going on to respond to my email. Email is kind of useless, even anonymous email, if you can't respond to it. For example, a reporter might want to know that these leaks are the real leaks. That, you know, Edward Snowden, he might have some questions about the leaks. So the anonymous replies, quote unquote anonymous, were supported uh, by the um, by the email server itself. And so you could bring it down pretty easily uh, by just looking at, and this is the first example of metadata, who's talking to who, you could just look at you could observe who's emailing the server and then look at where their email's going. You could figure out using this reply, this reply mechanism who's talking to who pretty easily. You don't you, you didn't even need machine learning. It was incredibly basic. And then you put a court order on the server and you get the list of correspondences between NIMS and, re, and true names. So the cypherpunks decided that this was a great chance to, to use anonymous technology to make possible to leak secrets and so they created an anonymous remailer it's called the cypherpunk version one and adam back who you may know from proof of work was one of the people running these and the problem is i create an anonymous email remailer and so there's kind of a little bit better they added pgp um one of the problems is how do you prevent anonymous spam so i'm going to send some mail sorry it's in dutch and i'm going to it's encrypted and then you know, the email remailer decrypts it, re-encrypts it, sends it out again. Um, so that's a little bit better than not using encryption. You can still basically make encrypted spam this way, and that's pretty dangerous. So, uh, add, and if you have encrypted spam, then how does your spam filter find it? So Adam Back had this genius concept called hash cache, where he said, well, what do you do with letters? Why isn't my letterbox completely full of spam? Because we force people to buy a stamp. So he said, wow, can we make a stamp? So he basically said, well, proof of work. You can just run this hash function over and over again until you find you know, a certain number of leading zeros or whatever. And that proves that you're not a spammer because a spammer would not be able to run that a billion times because it eventually does cost some money. So this is pre-Bitcoin, Adam Back, one of the original cypherpunks working on anonymous remailers. And Hal Finney, who was also one of the earliest Bitcoin devs, was working on this as well. And... On some level, it was a huge improvement. Um, you know, there are no tables on the server, uh, and you had PGP encryption, and they even started adding multiple remailers. So you could see in this diagram at the bottom, you could send email to one remailer, and then go to another one, then go to another one. And they had this kind of re re reply blocks, but they weren't very secure because you could do replay attacks. Uh, a replay attack um, is when I kind of send the message over and over again. I can take out the servers. Uh, so this is uh, so Hal Finney and Hughes worked on this in '96, and Adam Back went off and basically formed a company called Zero Knowledge Systems. This is the first, uh, you know, and they built an early version of Tor, uh, and it was founded by Austin Hill and his. Uh, who also found Blockstream, and Ian Goldberg, who's still working on Tor. And Zero Knowledge Systems built an early version of Tor in an early MixNet-based email system. And it was called the Freedom Network, which is, what a, what a great name. Who, who doesn't want to buy part of the Freedom Network? But it ends up, people, even though this company looked like it was going to be very successful, no one would participate in the Freedom Network. The company couldn't make any money because there was no digital cash. David Chom's digital cash failed. And people were like, oh, you expect me to pay with a credit card to be anonymous on the internet? That's crazy. And so the company eventually shut down. 
Um, at the same time, people started saying, well, you know, why are we just focused on email? Maybe we could store files, right? The Scientologists are trying to take out these actual, you know, kind of files about the, 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 the religious beliefs. Could we, could we store files anonymously? Could we store PDFs anonymously? And, they, and so the inventors of Tor, who were very young at the time, Nick Mathewson and Roger Dingaldine, and along with one of their friends, Mike Friedman, invented a system called Freehaven, which I'll share you a link from earlier. It's still the best source of information on anonymous technology. And Freehaven imagined a, a kind of large decentralized file storage system that would be impossible to censor. But it ended up being very complicated, and they kind of gave up on it because they couldn't figure out how to make peer-to-peer -peer work. They couldn't figure out how to, to make it accountable. They tried to build these reputation and payment systems, uh, but they couldn't figure out how to verify the behavior. When you look at Freehaven today, you're like, wow, you, could, you should build something like that. Uh, they just didn't have a blockchain back then. Just as Adam Back and Zero Knowledge Systems, what they really needed was some anonymous payment system. They needed Bitcoin or Monero or Zcash. And Freehaven needed a blockchain to verify behavior. But these were all missing. This is 2002. And so the, the email people kept working on it. And Lance Cottrell and Lynn Sassaman, uh, a lot of people do think Lynn Sassaman was Nakamoto. Um, he died shortly after Nakamoto's last message. Nakamoto, just FYI, sent his last message today. It's the anniversary of his last message that he's gone off to do other things. He's not going to be coming back. And shortly thereafter, Lynn Sassaman died. So there's some theory that Lynn, who I think was a PhD student at KU Leuven, where Claudia teaches and had the same PhD advisor as Claudia, had something to do with Bitcoin. Now, I knew Lynn personally, and uh, Lynn did complain to me about the lack of privacy in Bitcoin. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm sort of not entirely sure. I think it's a, there's a reasonable chance he was part of the maybe Nakamoto Collective, Maybe not, because he did really complain about the privacy, lack of privacy in Bitcoin. But then so did Nakamoto. So it's a difficult to tell. Regardless, Lynn Sassman made a new Mixnet called Mixmaster. And Mixmaster, which is a, even a name that I think is even cooler than Nim, uh, basically was an early Mixnet. It, uh, it's called Type 2. It had a network of what's called pool mixes and some mixes that look a little bit like Nim, stop and go mixes. But it had this big problem. So it used the mixnet. But there was no way to do um, anonymous replies. So it was more security. They were trying to figure out how could we do anonymous replies. And that's where George Denisis and the two founders of Tor come in. And George is one of the co-founders of NIM. And they build a system called MixMinion, another cool name. And Mixed Minion uh, originally had no reply box, but then George had this great idea. He could use this thing called the Sphinx Packet Format, which is used by Lightning and by NIM today. And it's a, you know, it's a packet and secure packet format for nested encryption. And it kind of every hop peels off a layer. So you basically can anonymously send messages forward and you can't basically, because at each level you peel off the encryption and the encryption is re-randomized, you basically can't uh, correlate the input messages and the output messages. You combine this with a mixnet and you're, you're, you're very close to them. And furthermore, uh, they invented what's called single-use reply blocks. And single-use reply blocks finally solve the reply issue. And this is what we have in... Um, NIM, uh, Serbs. At the same point, this is 2002, people are trying to figure out, including the Freehaven people, could, could, how is it they're going to make a mixnet be reliable? And they started looking at mixnet reputation systems. And this is where the concept of essentially using a token to judge the reputation of a mixnet came from. Again, way before Ethereum, way before Bitcoin, this is way back in 2002, people are trying to build these tokenized reputation systems on top of of effectively a mixnet, a mixnet. And, you know, but essentially there was a few people started saying, well, maybe we can make everything like tokenized and incentivized. And Jim McCoy and Bram Cohen, who later went on to invent BitTorrent, and Zuko, who we know, most of us know from Zcash, his name was actually Bryce back then. Sorry, I just doxed Zuko. But um, 
Anyways, um, Zuko basically worked for this company called Mojo Nation. Mojo Nation was going to try to do this anonymous file storage, uh, this file storage system, and they had a coin, you know, essentially a coin, I think it was called the Mojo, that would let you pay for file storage in a decentralized way. It was supposed to be robust and censorship resistant. But the problem is they didn't, you know, one of the nice things about Bitcoin is this kind of, there's only 21 million and they're printed very slowly. Uh, same with NIM. Uh, NIM has a very Bitcoin model. Ethereum and Cosmos have slightly different models with infinite inflation. And the problem with infinite inflation is that sometimes inflation is too high. So Mojo Nation had such a huge inflation that the price went to zero almost, had entered an inflationary death spiral. And so Mojo Nation collapsed. So people kind of gave up on financial incentives and tokens for a while. And that's why Tor doesn't have a token. Tor doesn't have a token because they didn't think about it. You can see that the inventors of Tor are thinking about tokens. They don't have a token because they think tokens and Bitcoin and incentives don't work. That's why. And the reason why they say they don't work is because they saw the hyperinflationary death spiral of Mojo Nation. And they basically said, look, we're going to build an altruistic system. Because if you build a system that has money in it, has some sort of reputation in it, people are going to try to fake their reputation. People are going to try to fake their, fake their money. People will try to do all sorts of things, and we don't know how to solve those problems. So that's why Tor was built partially the way it was. Paul Syverson from the U.S. Naval Research Lab kind of gave them their initial money and is still involved. And I don't think I need to describe Tor in detail. It's an onion routing system that is unlinkable, but again, because packets are first in, first out, uh, a global passive adversary like the NSA can de-anonymize packets. So... Uh, so you can see in this diagram where the NSA is kind of looking at and, you know, they, if they looked at who's sending the packets and who's receiving the packets, they could uh, de-anonymize. That's a dangerous attack on Tor. One them is trying to prevent. So, you know, originally I was, I was working on a VPN. That's me and Chelsea Manning. That's how me and uh, that's how we met. I said, why, you know, if we want to, um, one question I often get is why is Tor, uh, NIM not a nonprofit? And NIM, you know, we eventually will have a, a nonprofit, but we decide that startup is a good method to build software. And I know it's a good method because I worked with Rise Up and Leap for many years trying to build VPN systems. Just a human rights activist. And the fact of the matter is no one would ever donate enough money to keep it going. So everyone just says, why don't you just take Bitcoin donations? Trust me, I did that for seven years <laughs> before starting NIM. And so how NIM got together is the European Commission gave us a grant because they were upset the NSA of spying on Merkel's phone and spying on all the government's email. They said, can you build us something that's so powerful it even stops the NSA from spying on us? So myself, my old friend George Denisis, my old friend Claudia, uh, and we got a great, we got Anya on board. And she finished her whole PhD on mixed nets and built with this design. And Aglos Kiaia, who so went on the found Cordano. Uh, not found Cardano, so I work, developed the Cardano proof of stake system called Ouroboros. We all got together, and for four years, we started investigating mixed nets. And Anya and George had a new concept, and they bu even built a Go version called Cats and Pose, which is still somehow ghostly floating around out there. And the cool notion of Cats and Pose, uh, and the paper is called Lupix, is that we use what's called continuous time mixing. So continuous time mixing means rather than actually just shuffle the messages like a deck of cards, the messages are randomly delayed. And we use a particular mathematical trick called the Poisson process. And this is exactly what NIM still does. Basically, so we can guarantee the average time any packet should be sent, but any packet has a small chance of never being sent. And if it's never sent, just wait a little bit and you resend it. So it looks a little bit like TCIP. And furthermore, with other people using the packets, you send in loops, you send fake cover traffic in. Loopix architecture. And this led to the founding of NIM. So myself, Jetteridge, or Andrew, um, <coughs> Anya, and everyone got together. We got Binance to give us 500K. And I teamed up with my good friend Amir Taki, who uh, is now doing his own project called DarkFi about decentralized anonymous finance. We found a NIM back in 2018. That's us at the Web3 conference where we just finished talking with Stallman and Gav Wood and everyone. 
And then Claudia, on, uh, Dave had just joined. We raised another two point four million, and we get featured in Wired. So the team, you know, we're still only like eight people in two thousand nineteen. So still pretty small, but now we've started building Mixnet. You know, we start building the first version of Sphinx and Rust that actually works. We start building all these the first version of the validators based on Cosmos. Uh, we build a test net based on Liquid, which we doesn't support WebAssembly, so we then eventually switch over to Cosmos. And then we start growing. We get Polychain support, Alexi, and uh, many other people, including Theo, join. Uh, so you see that we, uh, you know, we're going to start. We're getting, looking more and more like a real company. And then A16 even jumps in. The team scales up to 20, now almost 50 people, getting bigger and bigger. We start running our test nets named after famous cypherpunks, like Finney from the original Remailer or Jude Milhoon. And then we finally launched with Coinlist in 2022 and raised $30 million, and this lets our team scale to the current large team is today and produce all the work that's being done. Uh, and so this is, I just want to kind of tell, tell people that, you know, we're revisiting this old cypherpunk technology. We're using modern cryptography and modern techniques. This is why we think NIM is a breakthrough. And all the old cypherpunks we know, you know, I was friends with Lynn Sassaman. Uh, he's unfortunately passed. But Adam Back, I saw a few months ago, he's a big NIM supporter. And he doesn't like uh, most uh, token-based technologies. Uh, Roger Dingledean, the founder of Tor, knows what we're doing and is pretty supportive. And, you know, we have a lot of people who are working on mixed nets, like Andrei Sergentov. You know, back in 2001, he did his PhD thesis on anonymous communications. And, you know, he jumps on. So a lot of the early cypherpunks understand what we're doing because they've seen this tech before and they've seen it last in zero knowledge systems. But now, you know, the problem is that Bitcoin is not complete. Bitcoin or whatever your favorite digital cash is, maybe it's Zcash, maybe it's Monero, uh, is not uh, the end solution of the cypherpunk dream. You know, people always wanted electronic cash. They wanted some digital cash that can't be controlled by a nation state. And Bitcoin does solve this, but again, it's not private. So you need side chains like Liquid or privacy enhanced currencies like Monero and Zcash. But these are still too slow for the most part. So we still don't have something as fast as Digicash, and Digicash was unfortunately centralized. So maybe that's a fundamental trade-off, man. it's a problem we can solve. We're working on that problem. Uh, still in the research phase, let's say. Then you have the Mixnet. The Mixnet, again, prevents traffic analysis by an adversary that can watch the entire network with this kind of God's eye view. You know, the NSA being example of that. And then NIM Mixnet solves this problem. And now, starting... Uh, probably in the next, over the next month or two, we're going to launch anonymous credential systems. And these are the systems that really formed and formed the cypherpunk said that, you know, you should be in control of your own identity. I don't want a number. I don't want to be identified by a unique number. I don't want to even be identified by a public key that everyone knows. I want to reveal different sides of myself to different people and have those be unlinkable. And the ZK NIM technology, which we're about to release, solves that issue. So again, the NIM MixNet, it's similar to Tor, multiple hops, but the breakthrough is it has cover traffic, time classification, and unlike Lupix, we have horizontal scalability. The more traffic that comes in, the more tokens people get, the bigger the network gets. So this is kind of great. It can be as fast and private as required by any application, not just blockchain applications. And so that's, a, you know, I don't know, you've probably already seen the slide, but this is a comparison of us and Tor and VPNs, but obviously you can see that kind of digital fingerprint of the traffic. Fingerprint's the same coming in and out with VPNs, same coming in and out of the tour, even though you have three hops, so it's harder to compel them. Uh, and with a mix that, you can see that the traffic is actually obfuscated. And so the last thing I want to mention is the ZK NIMS, which we're working on, the zero knowledge NIMS. And this allows cryptographically unlinkable transactions, could even perform a foundation for Zcash. Uh, could be used by Monero, could be used by all sorts of people, could be used by Bitcoiners. Um, we think ZK NIMS are not, but again, they're not just uh, for, for transfer of value. They're really about selective disclosures. You can have private attributes, which is those irritating things asked by KYC providers. 
Uh, you can do unlinkable pseudonyms. You can do multiple pseudonyms. You can prove all sorts of stuff. You can even build voting systems off of these things. Like all other systems of anonymous credentials, this is the first decentralized anonymous credential system. So there's no single point of failure. You can see our roadmap that we're building. You know, again, we launched NIM back in 2018. Uh, you know, got the first test net up. Um, Elm Liquid at the Chaos Computer Congress, which unfortunately is not happening this year, launching our Nymph testnet. Then we switch over to Cosmos and launched Finney and Milhoon. And now, you know, we, you can see these little green check marks. We're making progress. We still need to figure out the governance and the validator token. So that's going to be Nix, probably some form of airdrop to Nim holders. And we're going to launch our zero knowledge ZK Nim technology. And we're going to start, we're going to start integrating it's more and more wallets. So in fact, we're announcing a Blockstream Green integration tomorrow, and we should have a bunch more coming up. Then over the next year, we're gonna to try to basically make this thing faster and more secure and more anonymous. It's still very experimental tech. We wanna have a decentralized VPN service. We want, we want NIM to work in countries like Iran where there's censorship. We want partnerships with every major blockchain. And also, you know, we wanna see real demand for the NIM token. So the mix that will start being paid these anonymous bandwidth credentials and in the far more distant future we want to see everyone using this including signal we just recently had another discussion with them uh you know everyone's scared of google but there are people inside google that worked on mixnets like mixmaster with Lan uh with lynn sassman back in the day they would like to see google offer a, a private vpn service brave of course Britain ike's a big supporter and you know chelsea manning is working on hardware integration to really make and then mix that so fast it can scale to millions of users. And ideally, we kind of did some math and we think we can scale to about, if we got everything working properly, to about, you know, a quarter of all internet traffic. So that's, uh, that's where we're at. You know, it's been a big, long journey. It's already been, you know, I've been working on this five years already almost. And uh, that's just with them. If you look back further in the past, I've been working on almost a decade of panoramics. People like Claudia and George and our team are working for 20 years. And uh, we're really happy to see this technology actually come forth and uh, be real. And we think it accomplishes the fundamental dreams of the cypherpunk movement. The cypherpunk movement was not just Bitcoin. It was a group of technologies, guarantee human rights, guarantee freedom in the face of mass surveillance and repression, and you need all three technologies. You need mixnets, you need anonymous credentials, and you need digital cash. And we at NIM are going to provide, as we like to say, the next generation of privacy infrastructure, and that's going to be a full stack system. We need everything we can to defend our freedom in this day and age. So that's it, and I'm here to answer questions for the next 10 or 15 minutes. All right, Harry. Thanks for that. It was amazing. Although I, I will admit to the <clears throat> to the audience that I was cheating a little bit, and all of the other uh, team members were cheating a little bit because we already had a version of this presentation during our team meeting in Greece. But it was super <laughs> awesome, nonetheless. I will start because I can, because I'm the moderator. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, my own question first, and that is um, uh, something that you alluded uh, alluded to on one of our uh, internal channels. So we've mentioned here and there that. Uh, that uh, Discord is a pretty terrible platform. This platform, this very platform that we're on right now and having this call on, um, but uh, but not super in detail. So can you please uh, talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So there's two different kinds of apps, right? There's apps like PGP or Signal, which are encrypted. There's apps that just basically they're not actually what you call end-to-end -end encrypted. That means that anyone who controls the server can read your messages. Other, unfortunately, Discord is one of those companies where the Discord people can just read all of our messages. And that, as a cypher punk, uh, makes me uncomfortable. So I would really prefer that at some point, I know no one's going to like this, that we switch over to something with end-to-end -end encryption uh, like Matrix. Um, because otherwise, you can't really have good discussions if you believe someone's listening. On, over your back, and you know, this is the, the this is the same case with Telegram. So Discord and Telegram have about the same level of security. In fact, Discord may be even a little bit less secure, uh, insofar as that Discord is a U.S.-based company in San Francisco, while Telegram at least is a 
know, they do cooperate, I believe, with Russian intelligence on occasion. They're not directly under the domain of the U.S. intelligence community, unlike Discord. So you can you can just sort of assume that everything in Discord is getting sucked up in a database to be read later, at least by the United States. So, you know, if you're not afraid of the United States, that's fine, but I don't trust that government one bit. Uh, likewise, but Discord might be safer if you're Russian because Telegram, you know, has a lot of probably pressure from Russia. But if you're like myself, you prefer Telegram to Discord, even though the UX is worse, because it's less likely the US will get involved. Now, that being said, uh, what I would really prefer is something like end-to-end -end encryption. That's what Signal and Matrix provide, but those are still, you know, Signal can't scale to large groups easily. Uh, and um, Matrix is still kind of experimental software, though it is getting better. Maybe maybe we can uh, we can uh, already publicly commit to the fact that we're setting up uh, setting up a matrix server pretty soon, guys. It, of course, it takes some some preparation, and we need to uh, uh, we need to like find our way way around it and see how it works. But uh, a NIM uh, matrix server is coming very very soon, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Next question, and and uh, uh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I yeah, just go for the next question. Yeah. Yeah, so the next question, it came almost at the exact same second from two, uh, two uh, different people. So it's, um, uh, it's an important one. Uh, would, you, would you give uh, people like a, a, a list of books to read or, or, uh, or maybe movies to watch around the, the uh, cypherpunk culture? Yeah, unfortunately, there's not too much out there. Um, so there's a book. I'll, I'll tell you, uh, there's a book by Stephen Levi, which I recommend reading. And it's called Crypto. And it's not, um, unfortunately, I'll give you the Amazon link. It's, it's uh, I'm sure it's on Libgen, if you want to look it up there. Um, this book explains not really the cypherpunks, but it explains kind of how crypto came to be and how it got out of the hands of the NSA and was used for human freedom rather than just defending military communications. But what everyone should read, although a lot of the papers are very... Um, I would say, sorry, wait, my works are free. Um, this Freehaven, I don't know how many people are familiar with the Freehaven anonymous bibliography. So this is ran by the founders of Tor. And this is really, you know, cypherpunks write code, but they also have been writing papers for a while. This is considered the classic list, and it's really huge, of great papers in anonymous communications. So that's un called the Anonymous uh, Bibliography, Freehaven Selected Papers Anonymity. Um, if you want to read a bit more about the cypherpunks, you know, Tim May died uh, today, so it's the anniversary of his death. It's kind of amazing we're doing the talk on this day. Uh, there is a few, I don't know if there's a movie about the cypherpunks. You think there, there would be, but there is one little book um, which explains some of cypherpunk kind of um, culture, let's say. And that's the book actually called Cypherpunks um, by Julian Assange. So you can read more about this on Wikipedia. Uh, but the Julian Assange book has interviews where you kind of discussed some of the principles of being of the cypherpunk. So that book, I believe it's free online. And it sort of try, it's kind of a little bit pre Bitcoin, um, but it tries to explain some of the why, how WikiLeaks also came from the uh, the cypherpunk movement. So, uh, and this is a little bit of, this is actually not a bad web page on the history of the cypherpunks. Um, and then the Julian Assange book, I'll give you a link there. Be online. Uh, where are you dropping the links, by the way? Oh, oops. Uh, let me, I'm, I think, uh, I'm not sure. Let me, I think they're in, they're in the validator channel. Let me move them over to the... Oh, uh, no, no, no. Actually, uh, Ism Ismail, can you please copy over the links? Yeah, you can um, copy the um, link. The, um... right, put them in the validator channel by accident because I have too many windows open. Yes, yes, we'll do. I'll grab that. And yeah, so there's a lot of thank stuff you, you can read. You. There's not a single good thing, which has been unfortunate. Um, to be honest, the NIM white paper gives a pretty good overview of a lot of this stuff, but it's, you know, the NIM white paper is very big, so we don't really expect people to read it all. 
That was a pretty thorough list, um, and I didn't even know that that um, um, WikiLeaks um, possibly was 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 um, uh, like, you know, a a, a child of yeah. of uh, cypherpunk. Julian in Assange way. was on the cypherpunk mailing list when the Bitcoin white paper came out. Um, he was called his fake name was Mindax. He's a pretty good friend of mine. Uh, ben Laurie, who is our advisor that works for Google, was also on the cypherpunk mailing list. Uh, he was an early critic of Bitcoin. But he used to run secure serving server farm before kind of trying to do that for a big company. Um, and so, you know, there, there was a lot of really interesting people on the cypherpunk mailing list. I think Moxie was there as well when he was very young. So you have a lot of interesting folks. Unfortunately, we're on the mailing list today. We even sent the NIM white paper to the cypherpunk's mailing list, the same mailing list that the Bitcoin white paper came out on. Um, but, you know, to be honest, cypherpunk mailing list today... It's not quite as good as it used to be. Um, it used, uh, but that's maybe it'll get better. Maybe if everyone here joins it, uh, let me give you the mailing list here. Cypherpunk mailing list is still alive. Um, the the archive. So a lot of this information is unfortunately not recorded properly, but is uh, is available online. Let me see if I can find it. Um, yeah, it is is basically um, capable of of being discovered if you kind of go through the mailing list archives. So, any other questions? Yep, there there are a few more. Um, one is um, okay. is what we think about IPFS. I already mentioned our our collaboration with IPFS. Um, yeah, for, for... yeah. I mean, IPFS is anonymous, but it's a good technology. It works, and you can make it anonymous by putting it behind a mixnet. So that's what we're doing with uh, NIM drive and a non drop. So if people want to hack on that, that'd be great because I think the combination of NIM, uh, the NIM mixnet plus IPFS can really make this earlier concept of free haven a reality. Free haven or the Eternity service, which Adam Back used to work on, was this theory that we, that we awaited put files up on the internet that they couldn't be taken down and that they could be put there anonymously. We're still not there, but we're, we're pretty close. All right. Wait a second. Let me, oh yeah. And, uh, we're being asked, I think you, you addressed this, uh, at some point on, on, um, the, on our telegram channel, but still I'm, um, I'm keen to hear your thoughts on this. So what about the whole EU funding? Um, actually, um, um, dev random asks, uh, whether, you know whether the EU would f would knowingly fund something that would lead to the type of surveillance that the NSA is uh, is conducting impossible, namely us. Well, you have to remember governments compete with each other, right? So the the EU is actually pretty pissed off. The e the EU does not have something as powerful as the NSA, even though I'm sure they'd like to have something as powerful as the NSA. So when it was discovered that the U.S. was spying on various European chancellors like Merkel and presidents and prime ministers, using that information to beat them at various kind of often trading or uh, treaties, uh, they got pretty angry. That's why, for example, you know, the NSA is very powerful. That's why the U.S. could predict the Ukraine war, because Biden had a direct line, you know, into uh, to Putin's uh, communications. He could see every text message that Putin was sending properly. Remember once Julian Assange brought up, he said, you know, USA knows every time Putin buys a Coca-Cola, right? So the NSA is very powerful. And so there is interest from governments, not Russia. There is interest from governments in using this technology to defend themselves against other governments. And I'm kind of okay with that. That being said, you know, the problem with the European Commission is they gave us a little bit of money start the first version of this thing uh but you know ultimately it was research money it was viewed as a research project and we wanted to go beyond research and make real running code cypherpunks write code and a real company a real successful community-based project that could never be taken down and that's beyond what you can do with the european commission money so we no longer uh, i think currently we don't receive any european commission grant money that being said you know like any big institution um, you know, if the European Commission said, hey, we'd like to defend ourselves against the USA, I'd, I'd be happy to hear that. Uh, I was recently in uh, Ethiopia at the, U the UN with the former uh, head of the Central Bank of Ecuador. Ecuador, the guy, one of the people that put Julian Assange's uh, kind of uh, flight together in the Ecuadorian embassy. And we were trying to argue to African governments 
they need to defend themselves against mass surveillance. They need to defend their people against mass surveillance because otherwise they'll be manipulated by Google and Facebook, Europe, their colonizers, and the U.S. government as well. Um, we have two more questions that I would like to ask you. One is um, uh, is kind of a loaded one. Uh, why do all layer one solutions get privacy wrong? I think it's not clear. I mean, I'm not a. I, I think privacy is really hard, um, and it's not clear what it means to get it right. So with mixed nets, we know what it means to get it right. What it means to get it right is no one can tell who I'm talking to. So we know what that means. We know how to define that, and we can make probability judgments show someone is anonymous measuring it using techniques like entropy um however uh when you say let's make a blockchain anonymous it's tricky because the reason why people like blockchains is because they're transparent you know the fed can be producing a bunch of money you know lebanon's economy collapsed because the lebanese government printed too much money and no one knew about it so people like the transparency over the money they just don't like the transparency over their transactions so that's why I'm a big fan of side chains. I actually think the liquid side chains are a pretty cool invention. Doing a side, so you have transparency on the main chain, Bitcoin, obviously on a side chain. Uh, but that being said, obviously zero knowledge proofs are a better technology than homomorphic encryption. So there's probably a future for a lot of the zero knowledge technology as well. Um, it's just it is very hard to get right, both because the threat model is difficult and the mathematics are very difficult. And it's very easy to accidentally introduce bugs. So we knew about zero knowledge proofs. I knew about them back in 2000, I think 15, uh, because I used to work at MIT. And the guy in the office next to me was Madars Versa, who was working on what became Zcash, the founders of Zcash. At that time, people thought that zero knowledge proofs were crazy. And the math was really hard to understand. I had asked Madars, I said, would you trust this for sending money? And he said, no way. But now it's getting better and better. So I do think there's a lot of hope in the future. That eventually, all the L1s will get it right. And I'm happy to see groups like Manta and other groups make kind of generic libraries around zero-knowledge proofs for multiple blockchains. You know, we'll have our own library as well, the ZK NIM library. And the other one. It's also... Uh, sorry. Uh, should, okay, so the, yeah. the next one, which is, I think, also a great question. Um, uh, I'm going to summarize because it's a long one, but basically the asker points out that that uh, if if all goes according to plan, then then Nim will pretty pretty radically rearrange uh, uh, power structures um, and make mix uh, will make new things possible. So um, how are we dealing with this? Uh, both you personally and also Nim as a company and and also our individual security um, when it comes to the team members. So I've been through a lot of big court cases. You know, like I said, I was, you know, uh, when Julian Assange got stuck in the embassy, he enjoyed chatting about his legal problems with me because I'd already been through a few big ones, which I typically don't talk about because that's private. But, you know, I was spied on by the British government and the French government for climate change a protest. They tried pretty hard to destroy my life. So, uh, and the U.S. government. So I've had, uh, had FBI agents come into MIT and try to grab me once. Uh, so I've been through a lot, and I think the U.S. government knows that, and you know they know I'm not afraid, and I'm not going to start being afraid anytime soon. Um, furthermore, we're not idiots. We hired the best lawyer ever, uh, Ahmed, who you know was the first person to challenge mass surveillance, and in, in, in uh, the in the framework of Gautamo as our uh, general counsel. So, so one reason everyone says, why did you raise so much money? We raised so much money so we could fight legally. Legal battles are expensive, and if someone tries to force us to do something like a backdoor, we're going to fight, and we're going to shut down the project if we have to, but we're going to fight legally every step of the way. Um, third is, you know, the real solution is to make the code unstoppable. That basically means that, you know, M should be temporary as, a, as an entity, and that eventually it should decentralize in the community, become a fully free software project where the community runs it itself and you don't need me or Claudia or anyone else to tell you what to do. We think that might take another year or two, maybe three, hopefully not too much longer. And we do think you guys are capable of even doing it now to a large extent. We, I see in the room, you know, people of Nodes Guru are great technologists. You know, Hans is building all sorts of cool stuff. So we're already seeing the, the, the community that, that we think will basically take over NIM. And, you know, once, uh something is ran by 
people themselves, it can't ever be taken away. So just as you can't take cryptography away, you couldn't take PGP away uh, from people, we don't think you'll be able to take NIM away. Which which sounds amazing in terms of our future. Yeah. Can I ask you one one last question that I that I um, I skimmed over? So Kirito's Kirito's asking uh, might be a stupid question, uh, but could NIM work for an intranet at an office, a healthcare related office, on their servers for all in house computers, phones, instead of having um, VPNs on their servers? Is it, uh, yeah, this is the last question. You could use it like a VPN service inside of an intranet. Uh, you know, if you have a super secure network, you could use NIM as part of that super secure network. Uh, you could use it inside of internet. The problem is NAT firewall busting something Hans encountered is pretty tricky. But I think there'll be some, you know, we've recently released this WebSockets version NIM. We'll hopefully get a WebRTC version. I'm talking to Bitfinex about their key work about making uh, things more peer to peer. We think that uh, even though you could use this on the internet, it would be a bit hard because you might get stuck behind your firewall, but we should be able to have solutions for you uh, pretty soon next year in this space. Cool. Any other uh, questions? Um, well, Otherwise, I'm sorry, I, I, I will have to run because I'm dealing with security audits and stuff. But yeah, maybe one more question if there's one or comment. Okay, okay. I, I see one more question here. Um, um... Do you think the EU is capable of building any infrastructure that runs independent of the USA? Thinking of um, thinking here of the the fi fireware fiasco, I'm not aware of that one. Yeah, I mean, we wish, right? But I, I mean, I used to work uh, a lot with the EU, and I think they're effectively colonized by America and are in, uh, not particularly capable of building their own infrastructure, which is unfortunate. Now they did build some of their own COVID infrastructure, so maybe I'm wrong there. Um, but, um, you know, like they didn't seem, you know, I, I know the EU pretty well. They're all stuck on Cisco and Microsoft contracts or VPN, so they can't switch to NIM. I don't have much hope in the EU as, as a whole. That being said, there, you know, there are good people inside of Europe, just as there are good people in Asia and Africa, and we're going to work with good people uh, no matter where they are. Awesome. Well, with that, Harry... A huge thanks for for this lecture. It was absolutely amazing, and I think I'll let you go because I know that you have uh, some stuff to do. So, uh, yeah, sorry guys, we're trying to get the wallet as secure as possible. So I got to deal with some security audit reports, which all look pretty good. So don't worry, but we just want to make sure all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. Take care, everyone. Take care, Harry. Catch you later.